Hi there. So in the previous video, we talked about live attenuated vaccines, which really provoke an excellent immune response, typically lifelong, because those are in fact real infections. You are infected by a pathogen, but it's not causing disease. Your immune response, uh, resp your immune response system responds to the pathogen by, very, by generating a very strong adaptive immune response, T cells and B cells. And that typically results in lifelong immunity because of the production of memory B cells and memory T cells. Now, it's not always easy to generate a weakened version of a virus. It's not easy to evolve these viruses in the lab all the time. An easier way to generate immunity would be to use a killed or an active vaccine or a subunit vaccine, which we'll talk about in this video. So first, we're going to talk about uh, killed or inactivated vaccines. And uh, examples of these include the Salk polio vaccine, also known as inactivated polio vaccine, uh, rabies vaccine, hepatitis A, and some influenza uh, vaccines. Not all, just some. So in these vaccines, uh, any vaccine that is uh, talked about using killed or inactivated pathogen, uh, you grow the pathogen in the lab and then treat it with a chemical, such as formaldehyde. And that chemical attacks the viral proteins, the viral enzymes, the viral genetic material, such that the virus is unable to replicate. So uh, you have the virus, but it is chemically modified such that it will not replicate. So um, you inject individuals with this, but uh, since it can't replicate, it needs to be injected at typically higher doses. You need large amounts of this pathogen be injected into bodies in order to generate an immune response. You might need several doses, several shots, booster shots. And it's not as great as, as mimicking an infection because there is no replication of the pathogen. So when individuals are exposed to these vaccines, which again, you can make in the laboratory by just growing up the pathogen and then treating it with a chemical like formaldehyde, um, the, when injected into the body, these uh, inactivated, chemically modified viruses can be taken in by phagocytosis by via ma either macrophages or dendritic cells, or they can be recognized by uh, B cell receptors on the surface of my naive B cells. And this could result in a uh, immune response, a B cell and a T cell response. So yes, it is possible to get T cells to recognize peptides that are generated from this pathogen um, when uh, the antigens are broken down, antigen processing presentation about, by the dendritic cells, the macrophages, or the B cells. Um, but uh, not always a great response. The other uh, downside to these uh, types of vaccines is that you really have to ensure that 100% of the um, virus is inactivated by the chemicals. Because if you do not fully inactivate the or kill the pathogen using the chemical treatment, then in fact you will be injecting live, deadly, dangerous pathogens into people. So, um, you know, there are downsides to killed or inactivated vaccines, but they're fairly easy to make because you can just grow the pathogen in the lab, treat it with a chemical, and there you go, you got your vaccine. But again, it has to be tested to make sure that it's safe, that it's not actually causing the uh, disease, uh, and also that it's causing a robust um, enough immune response in order to prevent disease, which doesn't always do. Now let's talk about subunit vaccines, which um, are not going to cause disease because you are not getting injected with the pathogen. So this is unlike the previous two vaccines types we've talked about. You are not getting injected with a virus with the whole pathogen. You're being injected with part of the pathogen. So this is an example of these vaccines include the HPV or human papillomavirus vaccine as well as one version of the hepatitis B vaccine. So uh, in these types of vaccines, in a subunit vaccine, the goal is to generate an immune response to part of the pathogen. Scientists identify a part of the pathogen that they would like antibodies, for example, to be recognized to, 
Um, this typically is a molecule on the surface of the pathogen because the goal would be to generate neutralizing antibodies to um, the surface of the pathogen so that if you generate these antibodies, you can neutralize the virus, you can clear it from the system, you can prevent it from attaching to human cells. So a nice neutralizing antibody response would be great to prevent infection and or prevent disease. So scientists identify some molecule on the surface of the, of the pathogen they would like to have an immune response to. And for the example here, we're gonna talk about a, is a viral envelope protein, some virus uh, protein that might be on its surface that might be involved in attaching to human cells. And so it's fairly easy for scientists to sequence the genetic material of a virus and identify the gene responsible for coding the protein, um, the surface protein. And so once scientists have this gene in hand, they can put that gene into a organism in the laboratory. For example, a yeast cell or a bacterial cell. Yeast cells are better because the yeast are eukaryotes, humans are eukaryotes. So when generating those proteins, those proteins are modified with all the right molecules that, um, for example, any sugars that might modify them, or they might be folded properly. Again, yeast cells and human cells are very similar in many aspects. So um, if you can clone this gene for this viral surface antigen and put this gene into an organism in the laboratory, such as a yeast cell, you can um, genetically engineer that gene to produce large amounts of that protein in that yeast cell or other cell and harvest this protein. So you're basically making recombinant protein. This is lab-made protein, and this is the vaccine. This is what individuals are injected with when they have a subunit vaccine. They are injected with protein for, that is uh, made for, in some organism, for example, yeast, yeast uh, typically not made by the so we're not not made by the pathogen we're not making um you know human papillomavirus from the virus that we're making it it's a yeast cell that has been uh, genetically engineered to make the virus's protein and now that we have this virus protein we inject it into uh the human body and the goal here is that this uh protein will be taken into uh, professional antigen presenting cells such as macrophages and dendritic cells and uh, broken down by antigen processing and presentation presented on MHC molecules to T cells with T cell receptors that might have uh, T cell receptors that recognize the peptides. Um, the other goal here would be to get that um, protein to be recognized by some antigen binding site by some B cell receptor and that B cell becoming activated. And so the end result, hopefully, if this works in the subunit vaccine is to have B cells, T cells activate and identify this um, protein as uh, non-self and uh, have an immune response to it, generate antibodies that recognize that protein. And so that if we are in fact ever infected by this pathogen, we will have a strong immune response. We will have a antibody response. We will have a T cell response and we can clear the pathogen from the body. So that's a subunit vaccine. Now, this doesn't, uh, this isn't always the best type of vaccine because there's no real infection here. So the body sometimes need, needs a little more convincing to mount an immune response to this protein, right? Viruses and bacteria, provoke strong immune responses because they engage with many proteins in the cell that the cell recognizes as, oh, there's an infection here, so we've got to really ramp up the immune system. And sometimes recombinant protein just doesn't do it, but other times it does. So not everything works as a subunit vaccine, but uh, there are some good examples of subunit vaccines that are effective in human cells. All right, so now we've covered um, killed and activated vaccine, the subunit vaccines there. Um, and in a previous video, we covered live attenuated vaccines. In the next video, we will cover both DNA and RNA vaccines, as well as viral vector vaccines.
Thanks very much for watching.